Welcome to Apostolic Archive. We have gathered many wonderful sermons through the years and we have decided to share them with the world. We hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to our channel. Please like the video and comment with something you take away from this message. Also, hit the bell below so you can receive an update as soon as we upload new content. Blessings. Why don't we stand to our feet and lift our hands and tell the Lord that in prayer. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, whatever it takes, I am willing, God, to do whatever you desire of me this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's such an honor to see Brother Tim here today, and he is trying to avoid as many people as he can, but he said, I can't avoid being in the presence of the Lord this morning, and so we're very thankful that Brother Tim is here today, and if you will uh, uh, be very conscious of his privacy and not being able to be around a lot of people hugging and shaking hands, I know that he'll understand. Amen. Heath, I have not met you yet. But I have prayed prayers for you in the past few months because your name was brought to me uh, by your mother. And I just know that God has brought you around. And everybody give Heath a big hand. We're glad that you're here today in the house of the Lord. Amen, amen. The presence of God is very strong in this house this morning. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what I would be able to do without the presence of the Lord in my life. Without being able to come together with people of like precious faith and be able to worship and magnify the Lord. I want to thank my wife for that song this morning. I didn't know she was going to be singing it. We were laying in bed last night, as she said, and it came up, and I heard, I said, my, that takes me back a few years, and uh, some of those songs that we were raised on, but they still have a great meaning to me. Genesis chapter 35, verse 1 through verse 3. Genesis chapter 35, verse 1 through verse 3. God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God, that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods and, that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. Around here in the last few weeks, it seems like God has just been orchestrating and moving and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. In this last day, in this end time, if you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, we have got to be led of the Spirit of God. And so as a minister of the gospel, I do my best to be led of the Spirit. Pastor McGuire tries his best to be led of the Spirit. We do what we can, and I feel God is moving me in this direction today, and it seems like every service just fits like hand in glove to the one previous and the one that follows. And I believe that this morning will be no different than that. I want to preach to you for a few moments this morning on how far is it back to Bethel. How far is it back to Bethel? Would you just lift up your hands and honor the Lord one more time? Father, we thank you this morning and we give praise and honor to your name. Knowing God that you're able, I ask you to bless your servant today. I ask you to heal my heart, my mind, my spirit. Let me be in tune with you this morning, Lord, as we minister the word. Amen. Could you give the Lord a hand clap of praise and wake up your spirit this morning? Amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. Jacob was absolutely exhausted. He had walked at least 50 miles from Beersheba. Though he was tired, he kept looking back over his shoulder, wondering if someone, namely his big brother Esau, was following him. For you see, many of you know the story, but if you'll Humor me for a moment. Let me go through a bit of it. He had cheated his brother out of a very prized possession, his birthright. And now Jacob was running for his life. 
see there's something unique about sin, and that is that sin always drives people out. God hates sin, and the Bible says that carnality and flesh is enmity with God. So sin always drives people out. It drove our first parents out of the Garden of Eden. It drove Simon Peter out into the night where he wept bitterly. It drove Judas out into the night, and he hung himself. Sin drives people out, and sin drives people away from God. Sin was no different with this lonely young man by the name of Jacob who is wandering across the Palestinian hill country. The night is coming, and already the stars are beginning to twinkle in the sky. And So this young man by the name of Jacob lays down, doesn't have any comfort, so he takes a stone uses it as a pillow to keep his head out of the dirt. He soon finds himself asleep, and he dreams. And he dreams possibly the most beautiful and loveliest dream that is mentioned in the entire Bible. In his dream, this weary man sees a ladder that stretches from earth to heaven. Angels are ascending and descending upon this ladder. At the very top of the ladder, at the very apex, is the Lord. He identifies himself as the God of Jacob's grandfather and his father, Isaac and Abraham. Then the Lord promises Jacob, he said, one day, The whole country in which you are traveling in will be your own. But until then, God promises to keep him safe and to bring him back safely to his homeland. When Jacob awakens out of this sleep and the dream is gone, he declares something. He makes a bold declaration. He says, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. And he also went on to say that this is none other but the house of God and this is the gate to heaven and Jacob builds an altar there and he calls that place Bethel. He makes a promise to God. Anybody ever made a promise to God? Many of you have raised your hand. I'm going to ask you again, but don't raise your hand. Have you ever made a promise to God and you broke that promise? Probably everyone in this room could say, Brother Mark, I have made a promise to God and I have broken that promise. But he promises God. He said, God, if you will keep me and bring me back safely, I will serve you with all of my heart. So he takes up his staff and he journeys eastward, finally coming to Mesopotamia where he is employed by his mother's oldest brother, Laban. Laban proves to be a conniver. He proves to be a very hard man. And Jacob marries his daughter Leah first by accident and then marries Rachel in the end. And under Laban, Jacob grows to be hard and he grows to be a shrewd businessman. He becomes rich and he becomes powerful. But in the process of working for Laban and becoming rich and powerful and getting married, Jacob lost one thing. He lost his dreams and visions of God. He lost the company of angels. He lost the touch of heaven in his life. And he wanted to get it back. I have been talking with my wife here of late, and I begin to mention how people wander away from God and find themselves in other places, and they wander away from the very thing that could save them and deliver them, and they go searching for something new, something fresh, and and what they left was the very thing that's what they needed, and it seems like it's a very hard circle. It's a very hard trek to come back around to square one. But hear me this morning. 
if you've lost your vision of God, if you've lost your dreams of God, and you're no longer in touch with angels, I can tell you where you can find it. You can find it right back where you left him, right back at the altar, right back at Bethel. Life is a series of trade-offs. We give and we take. We gain and we lose. We trade off things. Sometimes we come up on the better end of the bargain. Other times we come in on the bottom end of the totem pole. But Jacob lost some things. He, he gained a lot of things, but he lost the things that were the most important. So 30 years later in his life, Jacob calls, here's God calling him away from Mesopotamia and back to Bethel. God reminded Jacob of the promise he had made to him when he built his altar. And God said, Jacob, I fulfilled my end of the bargain. And I'm simply waiting for you to come back to where it all began. Bethel, Jacob must have thought, the place where I saw angels. The place where I heard God's voice. The place where I made a vow to God. The place where I worshiped the Lord. Jacob knew that he was a long way in his life from the angels and the presence of God and the dreams and the visions that he had at Bethel. He was not only far away in location, but here's the most important part. He was a long way in his spirit from Bethel. He thought of the many idols that had now littered his family's tents. See, when you ever get away from Bethel, it's a lot harder to come back to Bethel than it was to leave Bethel. Because it seems the further we get away from Bethel, the further we get away from the church, we start putting on baggage. We start carrying things because we've made choices and decisions that were, were not, were not God-related. We, we make choices and decisions away from the dreams and away from the visions and away from the power and the presence of God and away from the dreams that we had. And when we try to come back to God and come back to Bethel, we've got all of this weight. For you see, he gained family. He gained riches. He gained material goods. But it seems like all of these things were now standing in his way from getting back to Bethel. There was no altar in his house, in his tent, unto the Lord God Jehovah. But there were idols from all the family members uh, that were littering his tent. Uh, friend, I believe if we're going to get back to where God wants us to be, we've got to clean up our homes. Uh, we've got to move some things around. Uh, and we've got to say, God, you uh, are going to be primary in our homes. Uh, you're going to be first and foremost in my house. How? Can I get back to Bethel? Yet he knew it was God's voice. So he dug a hole and he buried the idols. And with his family, he made his way back to Bethel. I could just imagine as he climbed that hill, he remembered how 30 years before he had come here lonely impoverished, frightened. Now he came back with his family and he came back a very rich man. Then he was running away. Now he was coming back. I don't know about you, but in my lifetime I can remember and I can take you to places and circumstances and church buildings where I came in contact with God in, in a very special way. 
I can take you back to the place in Indiana at a youth camp my dad was preaching where I got the Holy Ghost for the first time. I know what it felt like when I experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the very first time. Never been back to that camp again. I'd love to go back one day if they don't tear the building down. And I'd like to kneel in that general vicinity of that altar on the right side of that platform. I'd like to go back to my Bethel. I'd like to go back and experience again what I experienced for the very first time. Many of you could take me to the place. Many of you could tell me the experience that you had. And down through life, I've had some some life-changing experiences with God. I've had other times where I returned back to Bethel. I'm pulling for somebody this morning that's a long way from Bethel, and you're, you're a long way from angels ascending and descending. You're a long way from the presence of God, but I'm telling you that you're in the right place to come in contact once again with the power that you experienced when you built an altar unto the Lord. You said, Brother Whitehead, it's been 20 years, been 30 years, been 40 years. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It had been 30 years for Jacob. There are some places that you never forget. You can smell something. Boom, it takes you right back to 1972. Momo's house. You can experience something that takes you back to a revival where God touched you in a special way. You can feel something in a service and you can say, oh, that was akin to what I I felt 25 years ago in a prayer meeting somewhere. There are some places you never forget There was a spot where Jacob slept that night that he would never forget. (laughs) He took his family there. He said, boys, you see, there's there's that stone I used. I, I laid right there. I put my head right there on that stone for a pillow that night. You, you see there, there's a little mound of dirt. My altar's gone, but 30 years ago, that's where I built an altar. Pastor has mentioned it many times in the last little while. He says, you may leave and come back. But there's no guarantee that your kids are going to make it back. So there's things that I want my children to know about my experience with God. I want my children to know the visions and the dreams that I've had and the encounters with the Almighty that I've had. I preached you a couple Sundays ago about how you have a responsibility to me if you're older than me and I have a responsibility to everyone younger than me to make sure that they know about my experience, to make sure they know about the touch of God is in my life. I'm preaching to somebody here today. You may not be totally gone, but I'm telling you, you're a little cold in your spirit. You're a little cold in your mind. I'm begging you, how far is it back to Bethel? It's not far at all. It's just one step. It's God, I need you. It's God, forgive me. I need to be back in Bethel. I can see the hot, salty tears coursing down the face of Jacob and his sons as he sits them around that place where that altar was and tells them about his experience. The Bible says there Jacob offered a sacrifice to the true and living God, and there he worshiped the Lord. And wouldn't you know it, God appeared to Jacob right then and there. And he made a promise to multiply his family and to give him all the land for his own. I got a little ahead of myself, but 
Everybody has a Bethel in their lives. And by Bethel, I mean some time in your life when God came near. A place where you felt his presence. And your prayer was then, I'll trade sunshine for rain. Comfort for pain. Lord, that's what I will be willing to do. But somewhere between that experience with God and now, our willingness has waned. And we're not quite so willing anymore to do what we were willing to do then when we came in contact and God came near. Time passes. We lose sight of those moments. Much as the tide which sweeps over the lowland, our Bethels are covered beneath the flowing waters of time. But, but though you can't see it or feel it, that moment in your life, that, that Bethel is not gone. That Bethel is still there. It's just beneath the surface of time. In the Old Testament... The temple lay in ruins until a young man by the name of Josiah came to the throne. And he ordered that the temple be put in a state of repair. And while cleansing the temple and removing the debris and removing the junk, which had accumulated for years, you know what they discovered? Pastor knows. They discovered the word of God. How had they been operating the temple of God without the word of God? We have no church without the word. We have no power without the word. We have no anointing without the word. But there's so many people that have gotten so far from Bethel that they still have church. they got great singing. Great talent. Great programs, great ability, but, but no word. I hope to God when they tear up the building, if the Lord tarries the building I built in Natchitoches, we dug right here, Brother Tim, right beneath the pulpit. Before the slab was ever poured, I put in a little, little form there. Made the slab dip in. And right there in the middle underneath the platform in that slab, now covered with concrete, is a Bible in a Ziploc bag. Because you can't have church without the Word. You can have programs without the Word. You can have video screens without the Word. You can even have a Pretty good crowd without the word because talent seems to draw some people. But you'll never have life-changing experiences. You'll never have a time when God comes near. You'll never have a Bethel in your life without the word of God. And Jacob understood how important it was. Even 30 years later, I've got to get back to Bethel. Some of you in your younger years were powerhouses in the spirit. I may be younger than you this morning, but I'm in the Holy Ghost. Some of you have been powerful in the Word in your younger years. What did the old man Caleb say? I still got it. Give me my mouth, and he was 80 years old. Some of us just need to make it back to Bethel. Look down and say, oh, that's where I slept. 
That's where I slept when I saw angels ascending and descending. That's where I slept when God made a promise to me. And when I woke up right there was where I was standing when I made a promise to God. Does anybody remember the promises you made to God? And some of them you may have kept and some of them you may have broken. But God has not forgotten. And He wants to draw near this morning. He wants to pull you in close and say, child of God, it doesn't matter if you're 8 or 80. I haven't forgotten you and I haven't forgotten forgotten my promise it's time that we come back to Bethel how far is it preacher it's not far back to Bethel the story of Shah Jahan the great mogul the great uh, Mongol emperor rather and he lost his wife, his favorite wife. Now, he had more than one. I can't afford the one I got. But he had a favorite. That one's my favorite. Figured I'd fix all that. You know, I, sometimes I, I dig myself a hole. It's hard to get out of a hole with a shovel, is it not? But here's the point. He started building a temple around her casket to honor her. A large temple. A big temple to honor his favorite wife. Many of you know that temple by the name of the Taj Mahal. He was very particular and he became obsessed with it being the best and the greatest and the most beautiful. One day he was working and giving orders and instructions to the workers and he, he tripped over a dust-covered box and said, I need y'all to get that box out of here. It was later discovered that that was his wife's casket. We can get so consumed with everything and all the trimmings and the trappings that we forget why we're here. The Bible says that heaven and earth are going to pass away. He said, but my word is not going to pass away. These houses and lands, Brother, Brother Herschel made a comment to me the other day. He said, we may be all struggling to find a way to eat and live before this is all over. And that is the truth. Hear me. These things do not matter. This building does not matter. My house does not matter. My cars do not matter. What matters is the presence of God drawing near in my life because that's the only thing that's going to get me from this side to the other side and to live with Him in glory. It's time that we get back to Bethel. Oh, Jacob's Bethel existed amidst his connivings, his idolatry and his frustrations. His Bethel, Bethel was covered with all the things of this life. And it took God's voice to remind him of Bethel. Excuse me, she said. I need some help. The young woman repeated this several times, but no one seemed to hear her. The shopping mall was filled with its holiday crowds buying those last-minute gifts. The Christian bookstore that she was in, a sizable number of people were trying to reflect the true Christmas spirit by purchasing a gift with purpose. And the sweet strains of familiar carols began to waft through the store and humming, people were humming and singing along and, and browsing through books, hoping to find a perfect gift for a relative or a friend. And this voice was heard again. Please, the woman cried with a tinge of urgency, as you will see and hear sometimes in holiday crowds. Please, can you help me? Can somebody help me? The lady was possibly in her late 20s, looking around for a, an available sales clerk. 
She had a little disheveled appearance, a weary face, and in her arms she held a newborn baby. Clinging close to her side, the baby was, and the small girl who looked about two years of age was clinging to her skirt. The little girl's clothes and face and hair were, were a bit dirty. Somehow she was the miniature image of her mother. Even her mother's weary expression eerily haunted this child's features. Finally, a sales clerk said, can I help you? Yes, said the lady, I want to buy a Bible for my little girl. Well, drawled the sales clerk, that shouldn't be too difficult. We have a lot of children's Bibles here. And without further comment, the sales clerk pulled various children's Bibles from the shelf and displayed them to the young woman. And the woman carefully examined each Bible in her hands and, and that was shown to her and with curious intensity. And after thorough inspection of each one, she would shake her head vigorously and say, no, no, that's not it. Finally reaching the end of the stack, this holiday season frazzled sales clerk lost her patience. Well, what kind of children's book are you really looking for? She was annoyed. Well, the woman timidly replied with a far off sounding voice, I'm looking for a Bible like I had when I was a child. She went on to describe this Bible. And many of you will recognize this Bible. I went through our Sunday school department this morning trying to find one. She said, I'm looking for a Bible. And on the cover it has a picture of the Lord sitting blessing the children. Anybody ever remember that Bible? Oh, spouted the sales clerk. You should have said so in the first place. And as the clerk disappeared into the midst of the store, she began to look and find this Bible. As the sales clerk moved through the store, she was still annoyed by the things that she had heard and experienced. She looked around and all over the store, the activity from all the patrons had come to a standstill. Because something had arrested their attention. The sales clerk comes out of the back and said, here it is. Appearing from the storeroom, taking the Bible from its case, the woman slowly traced her finger over the cover and her gaze lingered on the face of Jesus. A change occurred in her appearance. She went from looking disheveled. This weary expression disappeared melted by the tears that flowed down her cheeks. This rugged sales clerk's demeanor softened a little bit. Looking across the store, people would see bright eyes filled with tears from patrons around the store. Women began to fish into their purses for Kleenex, and men were rubbing their eyes with the back of their hands like their allergies were bothering them. Something special indeed. An adult turned child was rejoined to the faith of her childhood. And this fact was not voiced in a powerful, articulate testimony because her tears said more than a testimony ever could. Those tears said... I'm coming back home. I've been away and now I've got some baggage. I've got a two-year-old and I've got a very small child. I'm coming back with more than I left with, but in reality I'm coming back with less than I left with. Jacob wandered from Bethel into the land of forgetfulness, into the home of idolatry. It's just as easy to do so today. We don't mean to do it. We don't mean to move into forgetfulness. But the path downward is the easiest path. And when our hearts and minds are overloaded, our feet just seem to choose the path of least resistance. 
And it's in this land that we trade shields of gold for shields of brass. We trade vital commodities for worthless trinkets. It's here that it's impossible to recognize the person you knew 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. The ladders from earth to glory have disintegrated and fallen down. Angels have faded from view. And if we were to interview any of them, we would ask, weren't you once at Bethel? Didn't God speak with you? Didn't you have a moment in your life when God drew near? I'm hurrying. The danger of straying from Bethel is that you always end up staying too long. Jacob stayed 30 years away from Bethel. I only meant to stay a moment. And here I have spent most of my life. My children don't even know my homeland. They have never seen my Bethel. They've grown accustomed to this idolatrous land and I've got to get out of here. God called Jacob back. Laban didn't want Jacob to go back. Let me tell you something. The world never wants you to go back to Bethel. It's this life's business to keep you as far from Bethel as it can. And only God can call you back Bethel. I don't know. Maybe God is saying something to someone here this morning. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree. It whispers, draw closer to me. God's calling, but here's the beautiful thing. When Jacob came back, the Lord met him there. Yes, he did. You're waiting on it. Brother Whitehead, what if I get there and God's not there? Not, not going to happen. When Jacob got back, Brother Tim, God met him there. The prodigal had sinned, but when he returned home, he found his father there in the street, racing towards him. Yes, the Lord will meet you there. How did it all begin? The prodigal said, I will arise and go to my father's house. You know what the Lord told Jacob? He said, Jacob, arise. Come back to God. Come back to yesterday's dedication. Come back to a conviction of long ago. Arise, go to Bethel, dwell there, stay there, don't leave there. I'm closing. You know what? We need to make living for God a way of life. Not just something we do, but a way of life. Pentecost is not just an experience, it's a lifestyle. Jacob had lost his way. 
You know, there's a lot of people that have experience with God. But it doesn't change their life. It doesn't change who they are. How far is it back to Bethel, preacher? Not very far. It may seem like a long way. Brother Kenny, that first step's a rough one. But that first step, then it's over. Because you're not far. The Bible says that he's not far from any one of us. There's something about God drawing near. Something about his presence that you can't duplicate. 30 years of life experience and he never had another one like he had at Bethel. He never forgot it. And I'm sure there were things in his life, certain smells, certain things that would happen he'd remember. And one day God said, arise and go back to Bethel. Take your family there. You know, you may live for God for whatever reason you want to put on it. Some people do it for a period of time to ease their conscience. I hope to God that I can live for Him and make it a forever thing. Not just something I feel when the world's going upside down. Not just something I do when something comes out in the papers that, that scares me a little bit. I want to live for God because I love Him. I want to live for God because I love it when He draws near. I want to live for God because I remember the experience I had at Bethel. Can we all stand all over this building and can we throw our hands in the air and say, God, would you help me make it back to Bethel? How far is it? It's not very far. And whatever it's not very far. Whatever it takes. It takes is that our prayer this morning? To be more, to be more like you. Like you. That's, That's what, what I'll be willing to do. Sing this as a prayer. I'll trade sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. That's, That's what, what I'll Woo. be willing Anybody willing to do. Is anybody willing to come to the altar and say, God, that's what I'll do. place right now.